All right. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you for being here today. I don't know about you, but I feel very optimistic about a new year. Yeah. It's nice to have a clean slate, isn't it? So um, I'll start with this, that uh, William James, who is thought of as the farther, farther, I'm sorry, I, those are last year's lips. Yeah. <laughs> William James, who is thought of as the father of American psychology, said, the greatest discovery of my generation is that a man can alter his life by altering his thinking. Now, before him, Ernest Holmes said it like this, if you would change your thinking, you would change your life. And we go, it can't be that easy. Can it really be that easy? Have you ever tried to change your thinking? It's work. Now, yes, you can change a thought in a moment, but to keep it changed, and this is the trick, to keep it changed, that takes a little more effort, but that's really where the reward is. So we are a new thought church, and in a new, in, in a new thought, what we, I think, new thought is teaching healthy-mindedness. Uh, think thoughts that support and give life. That's what we're after here, you know? So if I um, go to the New Testament and I look at Jesus, Jesus was a Jew, he was a rabbi, and he had a new thought. And now this is in my own language, but it was as if to say, I know what your religion teaches you, but I say to you, here's a thought that will give you more life. Hmm? So it's not the letter that gives life, it's the spirit that gives life, and spirit within you is ever unfolding. You know, it, the spirit within you is always trying to reveal more of its nature, more of its good, more of its love. So God, we say in the science of mind that God is always seeking a fuller and greater expression of itself. How that expression happens is by you and I putting it out there into the world. Mm -hmm. You know, in so many situations I think we find ourselves in that our thinking is absolutely not serving us. But it's familiar, right? But a new thought worth having would be having a God thought in place of my old thinking. And you know it's a God thought through the energy which you feel. Because if it's a God thought, you'll feel more alive. You'll feel more loving. You'll feel more committed and compassionate and connected and expansive and inclusive. Those are the God thoughts. Now, in A Course in Miracles, it says the ego, the small separate self, speaks first and it speaks loudest. And it's always fearful. That a fear thought, you feel more diminished. You feel anxious. You feel concerned. You feel separate, small, not much, on and on. So we get to choose which thoughts we're going to cultivate. You know, in the New Testament, St. Paul said it like this. He said, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think that's a great idea. I think that's right in alignment with science of mind. Yes, I will be transformed if I can renew my mind. But what I notice we do most of the time is we don't renew our mind. We actually re-old our mind or we rehash our mind. You know, we just keep thinking the stuff we've always been thinking, only we think it may be a little harder. You know, oh, really, if I, if, I focus, if I really focus on this, I can really make something happen here. And that has generally not worked very well for, for many of us. Um, so today, we know scientifically that if you have an ongoing, if you have a constant diet where you're expressing, you know, anger and con condemnation and resentment and fear of any form, and then you put some emotion with that, that is going to show up in the cells of your body. They know this scientifically now. So Bernie Siegel, who uh, was a, a surgeon and um, an author, he wrote Love, Medicine, and Miracles and some other books. He did this study of exceptional cancer patients. And he found that the exceptional cancer patients, they had a passion for life. Something go they had something going on that was bigger than their problem. And that energy gave them life, and it helped them have a shift, you know, to help to create a shift in them where they had a greater degree of aliveness because of this something that they had passion for. So I would ask you today, do you know right now what it is that makes you feel most alive? And if you don't, I hope that you will know by the end of the day, that you will know what is it that makes me feel the most alive. <laughs> See, um, there's an old saying about hitching your wagon to a star, and I think we've got to get good at that. We've got to get good at hitching our wagon to a star. You know, a high, and I'll say that star is a high, bright thought, a thought for the best possible outcome 
to be revealed. It has been proven, and our lives follow along, our, our, our predominant thought patterns. You know, Ernest Holmes says in the textbook, it is the general tendency of your thinking that is always manifesting. All right? So, so that's good news for some of us, because the general tendency of our thinking is life-affirming, it's positive, it's upbeat. It's not such good news for others, because the general tendency of our thinking is toward the negative and the life decreasing and what's wrong with things. You know, it is not a special talent to be able to see that something is wrong. You know, that is not a spiritual gift. That's just being, is what it is, okay? So, we could, if we chose, do things differently. See, I believe that it glorifies God. I believe that it honors God for your life to, to be good, for your life to work. Mm -hmm. That we co-create our life with God. This is what we teach in the science of mind. We are co-creators of our life experience. That your life is God's gift to you, and what you do with it is your gift back to God. So for our life to get really good, I think our actions in the outer world have to match what's within our heart. I would be happy if I could wake up like my dogs. I really would. You know, the way I wake up every morning is I feel this weight on my chest. And I open my eyes, and there's this little terrier with his face right here in my face. And he's just like so happy. It's a new day. Hey, let's get up. Let's wriggle. Let's pee on the lawn. Let's do it. You know? And now, this was the same as yesterday and the day before and the day before, but he is so happy. He is so happy to be alive. And it's like, well, you know, is that just wired into their DNA? I want to be more that way. You know, it's, it, it's, it seems as if they choose to be happy, that they are programmed to have a good day. Now, I believe that we are programmed to have a good day, but so often we don't because we're bringing all the reasons from yesterday and the day before into today, and that's what keeps us from having a good day. Remember Clint Eastwood? Go ahead. Make my day. Right? Well, don't wait for someone to make your day. Don't wait for someone to give you permission. You make your day because you decide to, because you can. You are a spiritual being. You are part of God. Right? So our, our real life, is not out here, as we, have, as we have all been taught. Our real life is spiritual, and it's that dimension that exists with inside of us. So I think if we, if we stopped seeing ourselves as a limited being, if we stopped identifying ourselves as being limited, you know, what that does is that disrespects the God within you. You are a great God being, and that's something I feel like all of us could start the new year on. That who I am is I am a great God being. You are part of God. That's all that you are. You are, you are made in the image and likeness of God. But, but I know we say things like, oh, but this is all I can do, and they won't let me, and on and on and on. What stifles you does not feed your soul. So those things that stifle us, I think we have to make an effort to move those things out of our life or spend as little time as possible on those things, and again, more of our energy, more in our effort on those things that make us feel the most alive, that make us, that make us feel the most up, up, upbeat, if you will. So what if, rather than being guided by fear, we had a new thought, something like, well, if I love something, I'm going to do it. And if I don't love something, I'm not going to do that. Now, I know that sounds really simple, doesn't it? But that would be really interesting if I only engaged in things that I really loved putting my life energy into. And, and if I couldn't completely cut them out, then the things that I didn't love putting my life energy into, I at least work toward minimizing those things. See, I look at the, the very high teachings of Jesus, and I think that Jesus' teachings actually were given in a concentrated form. And what our job is, is we add water to the teaching to make it um, palatable to us, you know, and I, I get to take it and embody as much as I can at my current level of consciousness. And over time, my consciousness will evolve, I, because that happens for all of us, and so then I'll be able to take a little more of that concentration. But here's a new thought. When I'm in fear, I'm trying to break out of one level and into a higher level. You know, that there's something within us that says, hey, there's an opportunity in here. You could rise up. You don't have to be held down by this fear. You could actually be accelerated and lifted up by it. I, I know the known feels safe. We all like the known, right? Even if it stinks. You know, it's like, 
It's like we, we choose known hell over unknown heaven again and again and again, just because it's familiar. They did a study uh, with these fish in a great big tank, and they put a pane of glass down the middle of the fish tank. And the fish would swim up to it, they'd bump into the glass, and then after a short period of time, the fish wouldn't swim that far anymore. So they take the glass out to see the fish are already conditioned. The fish are already conditioned, they swim up to where the glass was, and then they swim away. Now, I wonder if we're like that, you know, that, that we, that, do we have areas in our life where we think there's some invisible glass there and we can't go past that? I say, you know, thank you, God, that we live in a bigger world. Thank you, God, that we live in a bigger tank with no boundaries. Because, you know, there is that part of our personality, part of our human personality, not the divine part of us, but the human part of us that will do anything to keep us stuck, to keep us small, to keep us from moving forward. It, you know, it, it, there's a part of us that doesn't want our world to change. You know, but the bigger truth is, the spiritual reality is that we are divinely designed to grow, and part of our growth is we grow out of our fears. You know, I think it's probably true for every person here that there's some area in our life where we had fear at an earlier time, and we just don't have that anymore. You know, that we've all made that level of progress in some area. But life is very much, I think, about confronting our fears, holding them up to the light, and, and punching holes in them, proving that they are not true. That we find the place where we're stuck in order to get unstuck. It's not just find the place where we're stuck and move in. It's find the place where we're stuck and get unstuck. Right? Because every problem actually comes with a gift. You know, I can know more God in this situation if I'm open to it. We can take the gift or we can keep the problem, but not both. Not both. You either get the gift or you get to keep the problem. So maybe we should delete the word problem and replace it with project. I like that. That would be a new thought, right? I don't have problems. I have projects. And if I stay, because if I stay in a project, if I stay in a problem, it's going to keep me small. But in a project, I know I'm going to grow. I'm going to be grown by engaging in the project. I'm going to create something new. I'd rather be a bigger person than a smaller one. I think we all would. And in a project, I'm working towards something. It's good to have a vision of where you're headed. You know, think of how you will feel when it's, when it's so, right? When it's already accomplished. Because Ernest Holmes says that feeling is intelligently directed creation. So that feeling that we add to something when we pray, when we affirm, when we visualize is really, really important. Also, I think we want to have people in our corner who are supportive of our growth. There's probably not a person here that doesn't look back at the year that's gone by and say, okay, they were not very encouraging in my life. They were not in my corner. They poo-pooed everything I said I wanted to do or experience. We want to be spending more of our time with people who are in support of our growth and our expansion and our creative expression. You know, see, it's a different thing to go for the vision instead of running from the fear. You know, and I think we want to be people who are going towards something rather than away from something. You know, and, and we want friends who are in favor of our vision rather than reminding us of all the things that we should be afraid of. You know, and people love to do that. Well, I'm just worried about you. I only have your best interest at heart. I would hate to see you be disappointed. Thanks. Thanks. You know? See, um, if we're going for a vision, we're going to be more alive. And from that aliveness, everyone you touch will actually grow and heal because the aliveness within you is unstoppable. I know what happens is we take a few steps and we halt. You know the halt. We get hungry, angry, lonely, tired. We halt. But we don't have to. We don't have to. We take a few steps. And if there's a little halt, then you say, well, that's OK. This is temporary. I'm going to keep moving forward. You know, for life to be really good, we have to tell the truth about what you want. This is why I'm such a, a, a fan of, of goals and goal setting, why I'm having the workshop on Saturday, is, is you know that uh, you have to tell the truth about what you want. Because then the universe can respond. As long as you're playing it really small and really safe, the universe can't respond to that. So you know you have to bless your desires. You know, God has a sense of humor. There will be learning opportunities along the way. I guarantee it. 
Just because you say, okay, this is what I desire, and you start to move in that direction, doesn't mean there will be no opportunities to learn. There certainly will be. You know, we're here. Why not go for the gusto? You know, say, God, guide me. God, direct me. God, show me the way. See, I think the key to the path, or a key to the path now, I believe, and this would be a great practice for us if we could embrace this for the new year, is to bless it all and to keep blessing it, all right? Bless it until you can see the good in it. See, because that, that really is everything, you know, until uh, you can see somehow there's beauty in this. I know at first glance it doesn't look that way sometimes, but there is, you know, till you can see the good, till you can see the beauty in everything. Now, we say in Science of Mind that beauty is what God's love looks like. So everything is bringing you closer home. There is nothing God cannot use for our healing. Something is only bad if you make it bad in your mind. Why would you make it bad? Stop that. Just stop it right now. We want to reframe that. Just reframe it till you see the love in it. So before we came here, before your soul and my soul incarnated on earth, we chose a mission that primarily had to do with two things. And I think the first thing was we, our soul came here to learn something. You know, so we chose a family and we chose a time and we chose a place. Okay? Because that was going to be the perfect situation for what we needed to learn. But the other thing that our soul came here for was to give something. To give of that love and that creativity and that joy and talent, whatever it is that is within us, to give that out to the world. So I say to myself, okay, I chose this experience, but I guess I forgot. So I pretend I didn't choose it. But the truth is, we always chose it. You know, and, the, and I understand the veil of illusion can be very, very thick. But you know, when a baby is born, the doctor says, oh, it's a boy or it's a girl. They don't say, it's a light in the world. Right? Now, that omission, I think, is neglecting the bigger half of who we really are. I think of it as, as, as like as we've, we have spiritual amnesia. In Hawaii, when a baby is born, they say that that child is like a bowl of light. Isn't that a beautiful image? That that child is like a bowl of light. But every time there is fear or resentment, it's like placing a stone in that bowl. And what that does is that displaces the light. So our job is to remove from our bowl the things that stand between us and our light. So if we're not in um, who we are, who, if we're not being true to who we really are, if we're not being our real self, then it seems like we start to fade from life. You know, we disconnect from our light. And, and God lets us have many more days like what we have known till we take responsibility. In other words, our future is going to look remarkably like our past until we say, wait a minute here, I take responsibility for my thinking, I take responsibility for how I'm being in the world, I take my responsibility for what I'm thinking into the law of mind, what I'm seeing for the future, for myself, for my, for my people, for the world we live in. I have to take responsibility for that. We take charge of our destiny. Remember Carpe Diem, Seize the Day? Right? There's no such thing as a safe adventure. There is no safe adventure. That's why when you go on those websites and you read about some adventure travel, they always suggest you buy insurance. <laughs> you know? Because there is no such thing as safe adventure. If, if you want to guarantee, people say, well, I do that, but you know, I just want to guarantee. If you want to guarantee, buy a toaster. That's what you have to do. You know? So in, in, Helen Keller said it like this years ago. Helen Keller. She said, life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. So here we are. We are in the adventure, all of us. Whether you want to be or not, you're here. You're in the adventure. Right? Now, God has infinite good available. God says yes. The way the universe is wired is the universe is saying yes to you all the time according to your thinking and your belief. So I'm either getting out there or I'm crumbling into a heap. I'm either creating and loving and expressing or I'm holding back and I'm diminishing and I'm shrinking. Just tell yourself, you know, I will express my love. I will express my best qualities. I will express my light. I will express my heart's desire with a, without a guarantee of what's going to come back. But you know, Ernest Holmes teaches us in the science of mind, this is a reciprocal universe. So what you are really putting out is always, always what's coming back. And I know for all of us in 2019, it's going to be good. Let's pray.
Thank you. So we turn our attention inward for a moment, remembering that right here where we are, we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit, that that presence and power of God within us is the most true, most real thing about us. We are emanations of the most high God. And so in this awareness of our connection with God, I also know that we are all connected with each other on the unseen side of life, that we are all one in the mind and heart of God. And so I speak the word for us this day as we embark on a wonderful new year, a wonderful blank slate ahead. And I declare and I know and I believe for each and every one of us that it gets to be really, really good for us right now because we say so. I know that everything in our life that's up for healing, that the universe is absolutely supporting us in that healing. That everything we need is at our disposal. And so, therefore, we include in our prayer today our family members and friends, our parents and children, all of those we hold near and dear. We know that God is right there where they are in its fullness, surrounding them, lifting them, healing them, restoring and renewing. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. So everything that looks so disturbing to us, we say God is there even in the midst of that. God has peace. God has all needs met. God is reconciliation and healing and love. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams. We bless all paths to God. And we take just a moment now that whatever it is that you're holding dear in your heart this morning, we place that on the altar within. And know that God, that life, that love, that the universe are responding in the affirmative to our prayer. So I accept this is true for each and every one of us, that we are blessed to be together, that there is absolutely healing and joy and love for each and every one. And so with a full heart, I give thanks that this is so. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen. Amen.